I invite you to stand and turn and face the light as it comes into our midst. You may also light a candle in your own space and place it in front of you. In this season of Lent, we have been turning or reorienting ourselves toward the holy. As we've said throughout the season, what we pay attention to is what we are formed by. This night, we turn our attention to the suffering of the world, the sacrifice of the one who risked his life for the least and the oppressed. We turn our attention so that we might become persons who follow in the way of Jesus, working to bring love, working to bring justice, working to bring forgiveness to humanity and all of God's creation. Come and rest, come and listen, may the fullness of your light be for the Maker. When a community is under threat, when tragedy strikes, when fear seems close, we humans come together. It is what the disciples and the followers of Jesus did that last week of his life. Tensions were high, and while we may not be on the verge of crucifixion as Jesus was at that moment, we may feel a threat to goodness, a threat to love, to humanity's ability to move into hope, or we may fear, feel an inward threat of fear or anxiety or the kind of unrest that comes from a traumatic event in one's life and history, one that even the silence and listening has not been able to calm. Whatever you deal with, we gather as a community to hold the space and to hold the hope of healing. This evening, we embark on the journey with Jesus along the way of the cross. Come and rest, come and listen. There's a wisdom deep within that calls us closer. Come and rest. Come and listen. There's a wisdom deep within that calls us closer. During the season of Lent, we have sought a heightened state of attentiveness in our interaction with the divine presence. Tonight, through our service of shadows and in the silence, we will journey with Jesus in those last hours of his life. Just as the disciples and Jesus himself searched their hearts in that moment of trauma and tragedy, we search our own hearts. And yet we know that at our very core, we are connected to others through our connection to God. And so in this, we are invited to examine ourselves and pray on behalf of others. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, 
and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. For the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away for a second time and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again, he came back and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Have you ever just wished that the situation you are in and the pain you feel could simply be lifted from you, like waking from a bad dream? Jesus knows this pain. Let us pray for those who live in fear of persecution, for they are or for the, the stands they take on the side of the oppressed. And we find in that, we find the Jesus who felt afraid, alone, and yet offered himself for a higher purpose. Meanwhile, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant woman came and said to him, Suddenly, while Jesus was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, came with a mob carrying swords and clubs. They had been sent by the chief priests, legal experts, and elders. His betrayer had given them a sign. Arrest the man I kiss and take him away under guard. As soon as he got there, Judas said to Jesus, Rabbi, then he kissed him. Then they came and grabbed Jesus and arrested him. One of the bystanders drew a sword and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his ear. Jesus responded, have you come with swords and clubs to arrest me like an outlaw? Day after day, I was with you, teaching in the temple, but you did not arrest me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. And all his disciples left him and ran away. The sting of difficult relationships is something that most of us have experienced, perhaps as children, Trust was betrayed by an adult who did not care for us as we needed, or perhaps our trust was betrayed as adults. Family or spousal relationships crumble under the weight of addiction or illness or resentment. Let us pray for the ability to forgive and move on. We find here the Jesus who knew of betrayal and who broke bread with Judas anyway. As morning came, the elders of the people, both chief priests and legal experts, came together and Jesus was brought before their council. They said, if you are the Christ, tell us. And he answered, if I tell you, you won't believe. And if I ask you a question, you won't answer. But from now on, the human one will be seated on the right side of the power of God. They all said, are you God's son then? And he replied, you say that I am. Then they said, why do we need further testimony? We have heard it from his own lips. Perhaps church has always felt like a welcoming and safe space for you. 
but there are many in this world who have been harmed as they were cast out, denied the right to become religious leaders, ostracized and judged or sentenced for who they are. They are also those who have been the victims of religious and clergy abuse. At this Station at this place, we pray for the victims of the world, especially when the violence was done in the name of God. And we find the Jesus whose death was caught up in the entangled political and religious climate of his day. Meanwhile, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant woman came and said to him, You were also with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it in front of all of them, saying, I do not know what you are talking about. When he went over to the gate, another woman saw him and said to those who were there with him, This man was with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. With a solemn pledge, he denied it again, saying, I don't know the man. A short time later, those standing there came and said to Peter, You must be one of them. The way you talk gives you away. Then he cursed and swore, I don't know the man. At that very moment, the rooster crowed. Peter remembered Jesus' words. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and cried uncontrollably. Denial is a powerful coping mechanism when faced with pain that is too difficult to accept. In our weakness and despair, we sometimes turn to denial in order to survive. Here we find the Jesus who knows that we are human and we will have moments of denial when circumstances feel impossible and we ask for forgiveness for the times we might have turned our backs on our friends. Jesus was brought before Pilate, the governor. The governor said, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus replied, That's what you say. But he didn't answer when the chief priests and elders accused him. Then Pilate said, Don't you hear the testimony they bring against you? But he didn't answer, not even a single word. So the governor was greatly amazed. And Pilate said to the crowds, Then what should I do with this Jesus who is called Christ? And they all said, Crucify him. But he said, Why? What wrong has he done? And they shouted even louder, crucify him. Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere and that the riot was about to start. So he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It's your problem. So many people around the world suffer under governments who have washed their hands of the plight of the poor Money for weapons of war outweigh money for education or assistance for food and shelter outweigh assistance for at-risk youth or for safety of all the world's citizens. Here we pray for those in government who make decisions that affect people's lives and it is here we find the Jesus whose witness on behalf of the oppressed got him killed. Then Pilate had Jesus taken and whipped. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and dressed him in a purple robe. Over and over they went up to him and said, Greetings, King of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. Unimaginable numbers of people are victims of abuse, whether physical, sexual, emotional, or verbal. The scars are the same and last a lifetime. 
Here we pray for healing for those who have endured violence inflicted on body, mind, and spirit. And it is here we find the Jesus who knew this pain, yet also knows the depth of pain inside perpetrators that drive them to commit atrocities. The soldiers took Jesus prisoner. Carrying his cross by himself, he went out to the place called Skull Place, in Aramaic called Golgotha. The Roman techniques of death by crucifixion were notoriously brutal. Beyond the actual excruciating physical pain, the humiliation of bearing the instrument of death through the streets on the way to the execution was meant to prolong and intensify the suffering. And it's here that we find Jesus, the Jesus who carried the burden of his cross to Golgotha. We remember his earlier words that if we would only come to him, he would carry our burdens. We pray for all of those who carry heavy burdens and ask God to give them rest. As they led Jesus away, they grabbed Simon, a man from Cyrene, who was coming in from the countryside. They put the cross on his back and made him carry it behind Jesus. The bravery and compassion of those who rush to help in times of great need is something to experience. First responders, neighbors, friends, and strangers rush to assist in crisis in ways that restore our faith in humanity. Here we find the Jesus whose burden was lightened by one who bore the weight of his cross for a while. And we pray for all those who come to help in time of need and ask God for the strength to put ourselves in that place whenever we have the opportunity. A huge crowd of people followed Jesus, including women who were mourning and wailing for him. Jesus turned to the woman and the women that were there and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't cry for me. Rather, cry for yourselves and your children. The time will come when they will say, Happy are those who are unable to become pregnant, the wombs that never gave birth, and the breasts that have never nursed a child. Then they will say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. If they do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Expressions of grief and mourning are much more demonstrative in some cultures than others. The women whose weeping and wailing accompanied Jesus' march to the cross offered him an opportunity for his own lament and despair. Here we find the Jesus who proclaims his sorrow about the state of the world and its people, and we pray for all those humanitarians and all those activists who walked alongside, keeping vigil with those that kept proclaiming and those that keep before us the suffering of the world. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means skull place. They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. They crucified him. They divided up his clothes, drawing lots for them to determine who would take what. Roman crucifixion was used as a way of terrorizing the people whose lands they occupied. 
and was most often the preferred method for making a statement about political insurgents. And so death was not the main goal, but rather prolonged and lingering suffering. Hanging from nails through the hands and feet would ensure a slow death and make sure those who witnessed were frightened and intimidated into submission to the Roman state. Here we find the Jesus whose body was tortured to death and pray for all political prisoners who were unjustly detained, tortured, and murdered. One of the criminals hanging next to Jesus insulted him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. Responding, the other criminal spoke harshly to him. Don't you fear God, seeing that you are also have been sentenced to die? We are rightly condemned, for we are receiving the appropriate sentence for what we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus... Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you that today you will be with me in paradise. The conversation from the cross between three persons facing their own deaths ranged from denial to acceptance. We all do this when faced with grief. We want to be saved from the pain. We barter with God, we get angry and vengeful, and then accept the inevitable. Here we find the Jesus that is with us, no matter who we are or where we are on the journey. Jesus is with us and promises redemption at any moment. Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Jesus' mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene, stood near the cross. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Jesus knows his absence will be felt by many, but perhaps no greater than the absence his mother will feel. The band of disciples has become family, and this commissioning of his closest disciple to take his place as her son is repeated over and over again throughout humanity when a dying loved one says, take care of them. 
Here we find the Jesus who loves deeply and invites us to care, especially for those who have no family. Let us pray a prayer of thanksgiving for those who have become chosen family to us. It was now about noon, and darkness covered the whole earth until about three o'clock, while the sun stopped shining. Then the curtain in the sanctuary tore down the middle. Crying out in a loud voice, Jesus said, Father, into your hands I entrust my life. After he said this, he breathed for the last time. Here we find the Jesus whose final breath was accompanied by the ultimate letting go into God. I give you my spirit. At the time of Jesus, at the time of Jesus, breath was considered to be life and spirit. When someone gives their last breath, we are aware that the life has gone out of the body that was the only home to their spirit here on earth. For those that are left behind, this is difficult to accept, that it is all finished. God's last words in the human form of Jesus were that the spirit was returning to the creator. We give thanks that this is true for all those we have lost. We lift up the names of those we have lost and give thanks that God holds them even now. Were you there when the sun refused to shine? Were you there when the sun refused to shine? Oh, 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 oh. So to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when the sun refused to shine? That evening, a man named Joseph came. He was a rich man from Arimathea who had become a disciple of Jesus. He came to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate gave him permission to take it. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had carved out of the rock. After he rolled a large stone at the door of the tomb, he went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting in front of the tomb. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Let us pray. God of suffering, God of sacrificial love, God of redeeming grace, there are no more words, for it is finished. And while we know the rest of the story, we pause this night to stay in the abyss where there is no light. 
We listen for the new Jerusalem to be born in us out of the womb and tomb of darkness. Be with us, we pray, through the night of letting go.